Hey everyone, how are you all doing? <laughs> For those of you that will struggle with my accent, I'm going to try really hard to slow down, but if I don't, then I pray for the interpretation of tongues to be upon you. <laughs> hey, this is really great to be with you. Welcome everybody online. You know, I just really feel like there's somebody out there today watching that you are going to be impacted by the love of the Father today. Where you're sitting in your living room, you're going to feel his presence and it's going to impact your life and change you today. Let's all, I just want to pray for the people that are watching. Let's all join together. Father, we thank you that you are not only just here in this auditorium, but you are upon every living room that is tuned in, every office, every car, everywhere that's watching. Father, your presence is there as it is here. And Father, I pray that the impartation that's released in this meeting would also be released right where you're watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah, Lindley and I, wonderful woman that I'm married to, 30 years this, this uh, April, we'll be married. I'm pretty excited about it. We, uh, we missed a year. Somewhere on the line, we thought we were only married 28 years, and that this coming year was our 29th, and then we suddenly realised, oh, actually, oh, <laughs> it's 30. 30 is a big number. <laughs> Makes me feel old. But I got married very young. <laughs> so we're looking forward to um, a big celebration in April. Great to be with you. Catch the Fire Auckland sends their love to each one of you. It's so awesome being part of a global family, isn't it? Yeah. To know that there are people championing the same values all over this planet. And uh, we, we do a lot with Catch the Fire Sydney and Catch the Fire Melbourne fantastic people down there. We're up here with you guys. Next week, going to be in Toronto for the conference. Who's going up to the conference? Hey, a bunch of you. That's going to be great. It's sold out. Did you know that? Yeah. It's going to be an epic time. Watch online. There you go. Free. But you can make an offering. <laughs> so Auckland's doing well. We're enjoying it there. Lindley and I spent uh, nine years in Toronto, and uh, we went originally just to do the school of ministry and be a student, and you know, often God sneaks up on you and has a different plan for your life, who's, who's had that kind of, and so when we left New Zealand in 1998, I couldn't figure out why the Lord said, I want you to resign from your job and sell your house and move to the other side of the world. I didn't have an understanding of why he was doing that. But the journey to Toronto started a year before. We're in the end of 1997. Uh, Lindley and I had been married for a number of years and uh, we'd been trying to have a family and, and were unsuccessful in that situation. And so we went and entered into a fertility program. I don't know why I'm telling the story, but someone here needs to hear it. We went into a fertility program and at the end of that uh, process, we both realised that uh, we were told by the medical professions that we were infertile. And I have a letter at home uh, that says that I am 100% not working. <laughs> but, <laughs> but God. And so we, we, the day that we heard that news from the doctor uh, was the very day that John and Carol Arnott, our founding pastors, started doing 40 days of meetings in Auckland, New Zealand. And we went from the doctor's surgery uh, to uh, those meetings that night, and we saw John and Carol Arnott for the first time. And we were so impacted by what it was that they were carrying, who it was that they were carrying, that we were like, we have to go. And so we thought we were just going to go to a conference, and the Lord changed that plan, and it became... We're going to go and do the school of ministry that was a five-month school. And just before we were due to go, uh, the Lord gave me a dream where he showed me that our house, um, we'd finished renovating it, and the fence that I had not yet built had a sold sticker on the front and an aeroplane taking off. And Lindley and I were like, we need to sell our house and go. But Lord, 
We're only going for five months. Surely we could do a short-term rental. <laughs> He's like, no, I've got a better way. Little did we know that five months would become nine years. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, so, and what an amazing nine years yeah. it was. Immersed in revival. We arrived in 98, height of what God was moving and doing. Phenomenal time. So changed us that we had to go back to our homeland and bring what it was that we carried and was imparted to us in Toronto and released that in our home nation. Because New Zealand needs God. New Zealand needs the power of God, the fire of God, the love of God, just as much as the US of A, if not more. <laughs> But yeah, so we're on a wonderful journey. We planted Catch the Fire Auckland five years ago. I uh, also, so I lead Catch the Fire Auckland, but I don't do that full time. I also contract and consult in construction, uh, project management as well, uh, which is great. And you know, who, who, who here works in construction? A few of you. So it's quite funny when I rock up on site with, uh, you know, all the tradies, we call them tradies here, the electricians and the plumbers and the, the, the builders. And, you know, what do you do? And it's like, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> it either starts a conversation or ends one. <laughs> but I love being in that kind of environment because it keeps me connected with what God's doing in his kingdom because his kingdom extends to that site. It's not just here in church where God's kingdom is manifest. It's manifest all over the world. And we have a part to play, each one of us, in... Oh, I'll finish the story, yes. But God. Sorry. There is a, uh, a wonderful picture, a masterpiece, um, and it's called, um, I think it's called Checkmate. And it's a picture of a, a chess game. And there's, uh, the, the, on one side of the chess game, it's called, is the devil. And on the other side of the chess game is a young man. And the, the caption is Checkmate. And the inference is there that the, the devil has got this young man in Checkmate. And a grand chess grandmaster was studying this famous painting. And he was looking at the board and looking at it and realizing they've got it wrong. The young man's king has got one more move. And your king, my king, had one more move. And I was not infertile, I was able. <laughs> I had to make sure my language was correct. <laughs> but in Toronto in 2005, uh, Lindley, uh, my wife, was um, sitting in a conference. Mahesh Shavda was preaching, and he came down off the platform, and he was walking along the front, and he said, I see you with a baby in your arms. And... We had gotten to the point of we had no faith, no hope, no expectation that God would move in this area of our lives. It had been 13 years and uh, without success. So we'd given up. But because of our role in Toronto and being leaders of the School of Ministry, every time we get a new class of students and we'd tell our story. So everybody knows that we are, you know, been trying to have a family and been unsuccessful. So everybody has a dream. Everybody has a prophetic word. Everybody wants to pray for you, <laughs> which is awesome. But when you're on the receiving end and it doesn't work, it does get a little tiring and hope deferred makes the heart sick. So we had gotten to the point where we would tell our story, but then we would say, if you have a dream, that's great, but please don't tell me. If you have a prophetic word where you see us with children, that's great, but don't tell me. You go away and pray. And so what we just pushed that all down or away or, you know, we packed it in that place, that lockbox that you don't open. Who's got one of those? God's going to open your lockbox. And what, you hap what happened was that Lindley got very, very angry. <laughs> 
Once again, in front of 3,000 people, we've been called out again. So she's back in the hospitality suite after the meeting and she's crying and Pastor John is sitting across the table from her and she's like, why do people do this? (laughs) And Papa John, in his great wisdom and love, just looked across the table at her and said, but what if it's God? What if it's true? And sat her back. She's like, well, I guess that's okay then. And I believe that's a moment of faith reignited. And we need to have moments of faith being reignited where our hope has been deferred and our hearts are sick. And that next morning, Steve Long had asked Lindy to preach on never giving up. (laughs) I have it on DVD at home. And we had, Lindley and I had already talked about it. She's like, I'm not talking about our childlessness situation. She had a whole other message prepared. And she got up on the platform and the Holy Spirit fell on her and she just started, just, the whole story just came tumbling out. And uh, she's crying and uh, she came down off the platform and she said, I'm so, she went straight to John. She said, I'm so sorry, I messed that up completely. Little did she know that John was on his phone to Carol, who wasn't at that meeting. Carol, get online. (laughs) Lindley's preaching. It's amazing. (laughs) And he just took her in his arms. It was a bit of a mess, but he um, took her in his arms and just said, sweetheart, that's the best I've ever heard you preach. Such is the nature reflected in John of our heavenly father. (laughs) I want to be like him. (laughs) But then I went on a you know, ministry trip with John. We were in, in Germany doing a Father Loves You conference and it was about eight weeks later. And um, while I was away, Lindley started repainting the house and organising things and she couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> and various parts of her body started to hurt. And she was sitting down with a friend of ours who was trying to get pregnant and she said to her, you're pregnant. She said, I can't be pregnant. You know the story. No, 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 you need to go and do a test. <laughs> well, to cut a long story short, because I'm using all my time on this story, <laughs> is uh, when I got home, um, we had to go and buy a, one of those little sticks, clear blue stick. Lindley couldn't do it. She couldn't bring herself to do it. She went to the store five times. Because <laughs> what, what if it's not? But what if it is? But what if it's not? But what if it is? <laughs> So she said, you have to go. So I went, went and bought the, bought the stick, went home. We were so pregnant that instead of having, it was a, it was a, ne- a horizontal line and a vertical line. And if you got the plus sign, you were pregnant. Well, we were so pregnant that the horizontal line was completely gone and it was only a vertical line. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, look, see, we're not. And I'm like, we had the piece of paper and the stick and we're like, oh my Lord, we are, yes we are. And we went into shock. I was literally rocking on my friend's couch. <laughs> I was on AJ's couch, AJ and Alan are going, how does this happen? <laughs> and if you, if you know Alan, he's hilarious. He goes, well, it's a special hug between a mummy and a daddy. <laughs> so we have a wonderful Wonderful 12-year-old girl, Jordan, and she's a, she's a phenomenal blessing. She's a genuine, 100% miracle of God. And the story in that, there she is. Wow, look at that. The story in that is that, and this is what somebody needs to hear today. Lindley and I had no faith. We had no hope. We had no expectation. Doesn't matter what measure you looked at us on. To have a child, we were zero or negative. But the goodness of God, his plan for us, could not be thwarted. God's plan for your life will come to pass. It's helpful when you have faith. It's helpful when you have expectation. But your father so loves you and so wants to see what he has for you come to pass, that he will do it for you anyway. Your role is to stay 
plagued into him. Because even though for us, that area of our life, we had put one side, we still pursued him. We still loved him. We still asked for Lord plan A for our lives. What is plan A? We thought plan A was children. It wasn't plan A at that time. But it became plan A in the goodness and in the timing of God. So I bless you right now. If you're in that place of hopelessness, there is hope. It is his hope that he will put in you. And if you're in that place of faithlessness, there is faith, the gift of faith that he will put in your heart. Come on, Lord. Let's do it. In Jesus' name. So, on to the message. (laughs) God, you're good. Every one of us has a role to play in his kingdom. There's a, you have been saved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love for a reason. Yes. There is a purpose that only you can fulfill. There's a part of God's kingdom that needs to be manifest and only you can manifest that part. And you manifest that part of God's kingdom in your sphere of influence. Where is your sphere of influence? It is what you do on Monday. Now, you might go to school on Monday. Your classroom is your sphere of influence. You might go into a factory on Monday. That factory, that assembly line, that, store, that warehouse, that is your sphere of influence. You might go into an office. You might go, your sphere of influence may just be your home where you're raising your new child. It doesn't matter how big, because value in the kingdom is not about scale. You know, in, the, in our society, we value big things. You know, we, we look at somebody who earns a lot of money, lives in a big house, has a big job, and we think that is success. And we value success. But God's kingdom is different. God's kingdom actually says we are all valuable. Our value is equal, regardless of the scale of what we have or what we do. Success in the kingdom is entirely about stewardship. What What do you have, what have you been given, and what are you doing with it? You look at the parable of the talents, one talent, five talents, ten talents. The reward for that person that actually stewarded their talent was the same, the five and the ten. The only person that got in trouble was the person who did nothing with it. But success is about what you do with what you have, not how much of what you have. And if you compare yourself with somebody, comparison doesn't go anywhere good. You know, if I sit and I look at somebody, you know, who has a bigger church than me or has more money than me, then I either get proud or I get resentful. Comparison doesn't go anywhere good. So we need to stop it. (laughs) Stop it. Don't compare. Compare, comparison doesn't work. And only in this society, not God's kingdom, do we compare. God is about what are you doing with what I've given you. And that means that even though you have a little bit, if you do something with it, God is pleased. If you have a lot and do a lot with it, God is pleased. If you have a lot and don't do much with it, God isn't pleased. Him, much is given, much is required. So success in the kingdom is stewardship. Steward what you've been given. What's in your hand? What's your sphere of influence? You know, and I think, the, and uh, during the worship, I felt like there was somebody sitting at home who's housebound. And you can't get out. You don't go to school. You don't go to work. 
You've got some kind of illness or some kind of injury that's kept you at home. And in your heart, you're saying, what can I do? What can I offer? I can't give anything. I feel like the Lord says to you, your sphere of influence is the living room in which you are sitting right now. And there are caregivers coming into your life during the week, and you are to be joy to them. You will be the best patient that they encounter. They will see there's something different about you because the joy of the Lord is there. And I release joy into your heart right now that you will know the joy of the Lord and the joy that sits in your heart will overcome the depression that you're sitting in right now, thinking I've got nothing to do, nothing to say, nowhere to go. The Lord says you have a mission field and it's right in front of you and there's people coming to you every week that I want to touch with my joy. I release that to you right now in Jesus' name, wherever you might be. Come Holy Spirit. It's a part for you to play. And you have something to give. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13, verse 52, one of Jesus' shortest parables. Jesus had just done a lot of teaching and taught on a lot of different parables just on this one page that I'm looking at, there's the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, prophecy and the parables, the parable of the tears explained, the parable of the pearl of great price, the parable of the dragnet. And in verse 51, Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who out of his treasure brings things old and new. Everything that's in you, that's been imparted into you, is treasure. And we're tempted and sometimes to discard what's old and just look for what's new. But the writer of the Thessalonians says, hold, test everything and hold fast to that which is good. And Jesus said to, even said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. We often think the law, or I often thought, the law was bad. The law is confining, the law is constraining, the law is religious. Religion is bad. Kingdom, freedom, good. Religion, bondage, bad. I'm quite a binary thinker. <laughs> But Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. He didn't say that the law was bad. He came because none of us can fulfill it, only he can. And because we are in him, we have fulfilled the law. He is in us. We are in him. The mystery and of our glorious gospel. But the law in and of itself is not bad. And Jesus fulfills it. And there's a lot that we go through that is, we can term as bad, but it's not bad. It's actually good. I grew up in a Presbyterian church, traditional, singing hymns, one-hour service. I used to track the order of service, how many minutes to go before I can get out the door. There was no life in it. There was no Holy Spirit in it. When I got saved, I was tempted, got saved into a church that was uh, flowing in the Holy Spirit. So the church I got saved in was about, you know, I knew about speaking in tongues. I knew about being uh, slain in the Spirit and, and uh, seeing the power of God move. And so I was tempted to just get rid of and let go of everything that I had learnt up until that point. That's old. That's old wineskin. That's old language, that's old, but actually that period of time in my life built into me a lot of the word. Hold, fa test everything. There's some theology that was in there that wasn't good, for sure. 
But there's a lot that was good. Test everything and hold fast to that which is good. Because the kingdom of God is always advancing. It's always moving forward. God is always building precept upon precept, line upon line, block upon block. Nothing that God does, nothing that God says, nothing that God releases is bad. God is good and he has to be true to his nature. And so everything he does is good. And so we cannot just discard what he's done in the past because that's part of the treasure of our storehouse that we bring out, treasures old and new. It just becomes the building block for what comes next. And, our, and what comes next is what we need to move into now. And God has a plan for your sphere of influence that only you can fulfill. And you have an impartation from him you have, through people, from this church, from your previous church, from your parents. There's been impartation of truth. Test what is good and hold on to that. But you receive impartation and then you, that grows within you and becomes something unique that only you can offer. You know, that's a progression that we go through where we take on something, we honour where we got impartation from, but we then take that and allow it to grow and become our message, our revelation, our offering to the kingdom of God, our offering from us that God flows through and anoints into that place that we, he's placed us. And, you know, I, I'm encouraged when I look at, you know, the life of Jesus, because Jesus demonstrated this to us. When John the Baptist uh, was before Jesus, he was a forerunner, and his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came to see John, was baptized in the Jordan, and then led out into the wilderness for 40 days, and he came out of the wilderness preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He then did not mention repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand again. But then he went on to unpack for us the kingdom of heaven is like. He took the revelation of John. The revelation of John was Jesus' starting point. And then he then allowed the Holy Spirit to develop in him what comes next. And when Jesus sent out the 12 in Matthew chapter 10, he filled them and gave them power and authority. And then he sent, said, go out into Israel and preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And your starting point with your message will be the starting point, the same starting point of the person that imparted that message to you. When Lindley and I first started uh, ministering, all we talked about was the messages we had been taught. So my, my first preaching was John and Carol Arnott's importance of forgiveness message. And then we started preaching about John and Paula Sanford's judgments and inner vows and the healing of the heart message. And we started preaching, you know, Jack Frost and Ed Purick and the father, Father's Heart message. It wasn't ours, it was theirs, but it's our starting point. And we allowed that to actually develop in us, grow in us. And so then, then over time, we started to unpack specific revelation that the Lord was giving us in those areas and in others. And we now offer something to the body of Christ that only Lindley and Stuart can bring. And there's something that you can offer the body of Christ that only you can bring. And you are important. There's a continual invitation from our Heavenly Father to partner with Him in what He's doing. And you cannot discount the value of your contribution. You know, I think about the, the, you know, the little toe. Who has a little toe? I've got two of them. <laughs> but the little toe, the big toe and the heel are, act as a tripod for your foot. And if you take one leg of a tripod out, what happens? So the little toe 
doesn't look significant. It's often hidden in a boot. <laughs> but that little toe is very, very important. It has a part to play. And without it playing its part, the rest of the body does not function as it should. So do not compare the scale of what it is that you've been given. You know, we often look at the scale, you know, our little toe is what we've got, and we look at somebody's mouthpiece. We go, my reach is not as big. My volume is not as big. My platform is not as big. But I tell you, it is just as valuable. And you have something. And your responsibility is to take the impartations that have been put into your life from your parents all the way through. Test what and hold fast to what is good. Because that'll be it's building blocks into what's God got for you. And what God's got for you needs to be released on Monday in the place where you work, live, study, be. Your place of mission is where your place of influence is and your place of influence is, is where you go tomorrow. You know, I think the most important day of the week is not Sunday. The most important day of the week is Monday because Monday is the day that you go and do what God's asked you to do. I think about our, you know, I talk to our church. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. <coughs> I talk to our church about Sunday morning, Catch Fire Auckland is like an aircraft carrier. And on Sunday, all the planes come in and land on the aircraft carrier. And there they get refueled and they get rearmed. The pilots get refreshed and then they get shot off again. Where do they go? They go to their place of mission. And you think about an aircraft carrier dominates the region of which it's in. And this church is like an aircraft carrier in the Raleigh-Durham area and its reach spans from side to side of the city. And every one of you is an influencer of more people than you think. You know, if you're just a student in a classroom, there's probably 30, 35 people in that class that you touch every week, that you can influence for the kingdom every week. If you work, if you're a CEO of a company, that's a whole employee base and customer base that you influence every single week. If you are a parent of one child, you have an influence every single week. And God wants to use what he's putting in you because only you can bring forth the expression of the kingdom that needs to happen right there, right then. God needs you. He wants you. Because God could do it in a heartbeat, couldn't he? Like, woke up Monday morning, massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Everybody saw a vision of Jesus. Whole world saved in a minute. <laughs> Lord, let it be. <laughs> but he doesn't choose that, does he? He chooses you and me. And we all have a part to play. And we all have something to offer. And we need to start recognizing and valuing and treasuring the offering that we bring, the part that we play, the little piece of the kingdom of God that only you carry. And realize that it's important and valuable and needed. And it's going to be developed within you. It will start with some level of impartation, some message, some revelation, something. But revelation always precedes knowledge. I got a lot of pushback from my church with that statement, but you guys just went quiet. <laughs> Think about Isaac Newton. The apple fell from the tree. Did he have developed the theory of gravity before or after he had the revelation of the, with the apple falling? It followed. Right? Often, I'll create room, often, 
revelation precedes knowledge. And we have moments of revelation, something happens, we have an encounter. And then we start to unpack that. And that becomes knowledge. And that knowledge becomes transformational. And that transformation needs to then manifest somewhere in something. Thank you, Lord. I want to just offer you a perspective to sit in about your place of influence, that God is there. So we know and we hold dear that Christ is within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We invited him into our lives, into our hearts. The Bible says that when we do that, the Father and the Son come and make their home in us. We are in Christ. This is a foundational truth. We know this. So I am not discounting that in any form. But we are also in God. Christ in us, God in us, and us in God. Colossians 3, 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And I find it's helpful in thinking about my place of mission to think about me, myself, in God. Because God is omnipresent. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Which means that my place of work my school is God's because everything is God's. For him, from him, through him, are, to him are all things. Now, not everything is redeemed yet, but God is in all things. And if I think about myself as in God, then God is already at my place of work. God is there because it's his kingdom and he's there. So if God's in it and he's already working, then the question is, what's my role now? If I go thinking that the only way God will show up at work is if I show up at work, and then if I don't release God at work, then I can come under levels of condemnation about that. But if I sit in the perspective of God is at work at my work, he's already working because it's already his kingdom, then there's an invitation to partner with him because I go with God because I'm in God. So wherever God goes, I go. And I've just found that it's helpful to be able to go, God, you're already here. You're, you're, already, you're already at this place. You're already in my relationships. You're already in my work. You're already in the meeting that I'm about to go into. You're already, you're already at, you already know the problem that I'm about to encounter. So it's a, I find accessing the power of God, the revelation of God, the outworking of Christ in me in that place easier when I think about God already being there ahead of me. And it's a helpful little tool to release the little piece of the kingdom that I have wherever I am. And my encouragement to you today is you have something to say. You have something to do. Your role and your responsibility are to nurture it, grow it, and allow God to develop within you the uniqueness of whatever that message is. You know, we spend a lot of time watching, taking, downloading, teaching. You know, we, we listen to John Arnott's latest message, Duncan's latest podcast. What's, what's Bill Johnson got out today? You know, what's Sean Bolt's doing? And we, and we feed on new teaching. Where are they getting that from? They're not getting it from somebody else's podcast. They're getting it from here. 
The Lord is speaking to them, imparting fresh revelation, ideas, that's building upon that which they already know. And from them is coming a fresh message that we all consume and are grateful for. But I tell you today, there's a fresh message in each one of you that the Lord wants to bring forth. Take the impartation, nurture it, develop it, let it grow, and bring what you bring to the kingdom because that's how the kingdom extends. And you have a part to play, no matter how big or small. Let's all stand because I've gone over time. Oops. Father, I thank you that you are so interested in seeing us partner with you and work with you and co-labor with you, that you've given each one of us a special role that only we can fulfill. So Father, I ask right now for you to release in this room and to everybody watching online. Lord, what is it? What's the part that I play? What, I'm aware, Lord, that you are already in my Monday. So, Father, would you tell me what my role is for Monday? You're already working. So what part do I have to play? What bit do I do? Because you're already doing it. So, Father, I ask for impartation. I ask for a release of your spirit. <sighs> Father, I pray you'd provoke us to action. Father, because you, we are a house of your presence. And we encounter you, and you, the encounters with you transform our lives. Lord, let those transformations overflow into our Monday and impact those around us in Jesus' name. You know, some of you, I think, and I want to invite you to just come to the front if you feel like you've discounted what God's given you. If you've said, My, what I've got's not very good, or it's not very big, or it's not enough, or I wish I had more, There's an opportunity for you guys to just come to the, to the front, to the altar, to before your Lord and just say, Father, I thank you and I'm grateful for what you've given me. Lord, would you nurture it, grow it, develop it, that it might be released for your glory. If my story at the beginning of this message about childlessness and hope struck a chord with you, it may not be childlessness, but it might be a dream that you've had in your heart that's just not coming to pass and you're getting weary in the wait. And I want to pray for you, lay hands on you and impart hope. I invite you guys to come forward as well ministry team if you guys would like to come and start to lay hands on people and pray for people and for the rest of you I bless you